All right. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9 says this. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may, for the, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them <clears throat> as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God bless his word this morning. Let's pray together, shall we, before we dive into this. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We thank you, Lord, that no matter where we put our finger in scripture, we find things, Father, that can be used by us and for us and that you can use to strengthen us and encourage us and remind us of the goodness and faithfulness of our God. So, Lord, take these words today, and I pray, above all, that you would use them to do exactly that, Father, to encourage us in a way that only you can do. And all God's people said, <clears throat> amen. You may be seated. Good passage of Scripture. This is one that, I don't, how many of you have read this before? Okay, good. I know Eric has. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this, is a, this is a passage of Scripture that has been used over and over and over again by Jews, by the Israelites, and even Jesus used it in the New Testament. It is one that has become for the Jews a very important, especially as we're going to zero in today on just two of those verses, but I want to kind of tie the whole passage into it. But those two verses have become, for a lot of people, an example of prayer, an example of commitment, of one of some astounding truths that are found in such few short words. <clears throat> like I said, Deuteronomy is a book that is long. It's full of, of laws and legalisms and, and do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And yet it is, it is, as a believer, we oftentimes need to be reminded that not only do we exercise faith in a Savior who is really, really strong and able to, to do exactly that, to save us, but we also need to know that when we have that, when, that become, when he becomes a part of our life in that way, then what motivates us to do things is that which is in here. And so to live a life of rules and regulations can be sometimes easier than living by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Because there are times when God asks us to do things that we go, whoa, I'm not sure I have the strength to do that. Whereas if you give me 10, 20, 30 things that I have to live by, that I have to read every morning, and know how to conduct myself during the day, I can probably do that because I'm human. I can understand that. But to, to feel the, the promptings of God to do something that maybe is outside of your lane, outside of something that you feel comfortable with, then that's where the beauty of the Holy Spirit comes in. And his word, his word in Deuteronomy can be very precious to you and to me at times when we really need strength from him. It's the second giving of the law. It's a good picture of the Christian life. What, they're back again 
ready to go over into the promised land. They had been wandering out there for basically a generation. Forty years in that time would be a generation. People would have lived and died during that time. They would have been born during that time. And by the time they cross over, so many things have changed. Maybe because of disobedience they did that. I'm sure that was part of it. But there was just something about, when we think about the Christian life, it's a journey. It's, it's where we, we maybe are not wandering in the wilderness all the time, but we are wandering sometimes into areas that can be very difficult. And to have those promises before us are really the key to being able to function as a Christian, as a believer. You and I know what it is to do that which is right. But we know it because of who we serve. You know, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. He was a theologian and a great writer. <clears throat> he wrote a book called, called How Should We Then Live? In other words, now that Jesus is part of my life, now that I have given myself over to him, how am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to respond to what he has done for me? How do I conduct myself in a society or in a world that is so opposed to the things of God? And that's where the rubber hits the road in the Christian life. Because without him first, we have no ability whatsoever to be able to deal with all the garbage, all the stuff that comes our way as believers. And it doesn't matter when you came to Christ. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. You could come to Christ when you're four. You can come to Christ when you're 44 or when you're 94. It doesn't matter. But that at that point, a journey begins. A journey begins almost like the Israelites in this case, to where they are looking forward to something that is so great and glorious. <clears throat> so verses, verses 1 through 3 are pretty self-explanatory. That It's the covenant promises of God. They needed to be reminded in this book by Moses of all that has happened to them on this long journey. <clears throat> their deliverance out of Egypt, their journey in the wilderness, the spies who went into the land, their refusal to go into the land, their wandering for 40 years. And now, all of that is behind them, and they're on the edge of doing this again. And so what a, what a perfect few, few verses to give to them as they ready themselves to do exactly this. They're under a covenant. You know, the law, is, the law was never designed to save anybody. The law was, was designed to lead us to something. In fact, the New Testament says the law was a child leader. It was one who grabbed you by the hand, just like a tutor would take a young child to school and help them and take them to the place where they can really learn and know. So it was never designed in itself <clears throat> to be a picture of salvation. It was a designed to lead us to the one who could save us. And it was true in the Old Testament, and it's obviously true in the New Testament. God's word is complete from beginning to end. So they're under a covenant, just like you and I are under a covenant. We are under the Abrahamic co covenant just like they were. They had had promises made to them in, in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15 that God promised Abraham that he would take him into a land, that he would give him a nation, that he would give him a huge amount of offspring like the stars of the sky. And that promise is still in effect. Paul says that hasn't gone away. We are still under the umbrella of that covenant and the ultimate goal, of course, of that covenant was Jesus. But the ultimate goal beyond that is to actually enter into <clears throat> what God has promised for his people. So they are being told, because of where you're going and what God has promised, you need to, Moses says, you have to live by and understand the decrees and, and the, the do's and don'ts that I'm listing for you. And so they're under this covenant. You know, you think about... How many times they need to be reminded of that? 
How many times do you and I need to be reminded of the things that, not that we forget them, and no, Joe, I don't forget everything, but I do forget some things. We need to, it's not that we've forgotten about the promises of God, not that we've forgotten about what God has done for us, but we need to constantly be reminded of what he has done. And not only what he has done, but what he is going to do. Now, why do we, for example, why do we as a church celebrate communion every Sunday? Why do we partake in the broken body and the shed blood of Christ every Sunday or any other time that you do it? You might do it during the week. I don't know. You can do it any time you want. But we do it every week on purpose. Why? Because Paul says, do this in remembrance of me. We need to be constantly, constantly reminded of what God has done. You know, he's, he's going to finish what he started. My, one of my life verses is Philippians 1.6. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need a drink of water. I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it or perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. There is a journey that we're on that someday will come to a conclusion to start something brand new. But they, we need to be constantly told that. What is it about humans? What is it about frail, sinful individuals that we constantly have to, God, flash things in front of us over and over and over again? so that they really become, not only in here, but they travel down it and finally get here. And that's, that's what they were going through. Those first verses are exactly that. He says, this is the commandment that, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, Moses says, that you may do them in the land to which you are going to possess it. Christian life is, is a very interesting life. But really what I want to concentrate on this morning is the second point, and that's in verses 4 and 5. And I want to read them again, because it's a unique relationship with God that we have because of these. I think about who he was talking to, who these people were, who the Israelites were, that they were called out of a pagan land to go into this wilderness and then to cross the river and go into another pagan land. Surrounded by unbelievable idolatry. And so what does he say? He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might. Hear. This is called, the, in Hebrew, the Jews call it the Shema Israel. In other words, hear, O Israel. The word for, for here is Shema, and it, and it is more than just listening or hearing. It is really, really listening and responding to something. He says, hear, O Israel, you've got to hear this now. This is the time to hear it. And there's, there's tons of illustrations that come to your mind <clears throat> when you talk about this word, because if you've raised any kids or you've been around kids, and they, as little ones between two and five, they... they they have a hard time sometimes paying attention to you. So you take their little face and you put your hands on each cheek and you say, Joey, listen to me. Look at me. I've got to tell you something. And so finally when the eyes are focused and when things are just right, you're able to tell them something that they really hear and understand. Now I can relate that I'm not five years old, but I, I can remember... Yes, Eric, I can remember when I was in elementary school, okay? So <laughs> we were taught, we were taught because in a small town where I was raised, the elementary school was in walking distance basically for all the kids, and so we all walked to school, right? Well, of course, the teachers would always say, okay, remember this, stop, look, and listen, right? You're walking home, you come to a, a street, before you go into that crosswalk, you stop, you look both ways, and you listen to hear if something's coming. 
And then, at that point, you can go. All right? Another example I have, now that I'm older, I still have this issue of listening, of hearing. So I can be 10 feet across from Eileen in the family room, and she'll tell me something. <clears throat> she'll begin to share something, and my mind is probably, I don't know where it's at. It's half of me looking at the television set, half of me's out in the barn taking care of critters. I don't know what it is that she has to stop right in the middle of it and say, Joe, are you listening to me? <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Uh, no. Uh, so would you, would you say it again? And so when she says, you guys shaking your head, I'm sure you do this sometimes. It's not just me. So don't be pointing a finger at me. So you listen. You finally focus with your eyes, not just with your eyes, but with your mind and with everything else, and you listen to what she has to say. Only then, when I really hear what it is she's trying to tell me, can I respond? Can I do something? She might be asking me something really important, and I just kind of shrug it off, and, and, and it doesn't work that way. So to hear that, that first word of, that, of that, those two verses is hear, listen, stop. Just stop and listen. So even as we gather in a congregation like this, or you go to some other meeting at work, or whatever it is, you have to sometimes, because your mind is so keen on so many other things, that the Lord has to tell you, stop. Just stop it, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and listen, and listen really close. And he's, we have to listen to the message that says, Hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel, your Lord is one. Your Lord is one God. So that, that goes against these, these two verses. I don't know if you've ever heard of the word mezuzah. Mezuzah is a little tube that's all decorated, and you put a little piece of parchment inside of it and, and close it up. And Jews do this, and they put it on the side of their doorpost. And inside that mezuzah is this little scroll that quotes these two verses, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And every time they go into the house, they touch it or kiss it. Every time they leave the house, they touch it or kiss it. It's just a symbol of understanding the most important aspect of serving a God who is truly the only God. Now, that's not a, that's not a popular message in the country we live in today. That's not popular to say we serve not just God, we serve the only God, right? And you get feedback from that, right? That's a nice word, feedback. Sometimes you get more than that. Because what they think you are doing is excluding anybody else who has any kind of faith in whatever it is. And so it can be a message that is, that is rather uh, annoying to some people, right? But it's critical. Israel needed to know. And we are not Israel. I'm not Jewish, and I don't think anybody in this room is Jewish. But there's something about what happened when Jesus <clears throat> fulfilled and began to fulfill the covenant with Abraham. Paul says, you as Gentiles, there's only two people in the world, either you're Jewish or you're Gentile. Many, many nations, but who cares? You're Jewish or you're Gentile. And Gentiles had to somehow be grafted in to the promise that was given specifically to these people in Deuteronomy 6. And thank God that he did that. And he says, you are now, because of your faith in Christ, you are now grafted in to the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. So we, we get to celebrate that too. But there's, God has shown his way and who he is and what he can do so many times to these people that are here in Deuteronomy 6 that you'd wonder how in the world could they not get what Moses is trying to tell them. They are about to go, why is this so important? They are about to go into a land where Yahweh, Jehovah God, is absolutely not known by anybody, and they could care less who he is. They have their own, whatever pagan system it is, whatever idolatry, whatever idols they have in their house that they bow down to worship, whatever that is, they, they physically worshiped things, idols, things that that Scripture says have absolutely no mind, no voice, no nothing. 
And so it was so important for Israel to say, to learn, God is one. There's only one. We call it, in our theological word, we call it monotheistic, okay? Joe likes to have you say things. So say monotheist, monotheistic. What does that mean? It means mono, one, theistic God. There's only one God. We're not polytheistic. We're many gods. We are one. If there's only one God, then that excludes a whole bunch of others, right? Little g gods. So he knew, God knew how important it was before they go into this land, before, as we were talking about in Joshua, what happens in Joshua? Why is it so blooming violent when you read the passages in Joshua? Why is that? People dying all over the place. People being killed. Men, women, children are being slaughtered. Why? Because God said, you cannot mix idolatry with me. It doesn't work. You can't, you can't have me as your only God and, and not wipe out anything else that has nothing to do with me. That, sounds, that may seem harsh to some of us, but yet he knows, God knows human nature. Now, we may not have idols in our house today. We may not have things that we put on the shelf that we worship or whatever that <clears throat> pagan ministry might be. But we do have other things, with little gods, little gods with a little g, that sometimes will try to take the place of him, that, that creep into our lives, kind of unknown sometimes. You know, the gods of, of wealth. Wealth is a good one. Everybody wants to be wealthy. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with money in and itself. But it, it is, can be, a root of problem, right? So we have that little God. We have, we have the God of success. We have God of sex. We have God of, of lust. We have all these things that sometimes creep in and begin to take over what God has intended strictly for himself. And the, the idea of serving only one God is so critical to our understanding of who he is and why if we invite him into our life. That is a unique relationship that can only happen when we surrender to that God, right? It's easy to surrender to the others. It's easy to get mixed up. And, okay, I don't know what goes, what goes around in your mind or everything during the week or things that you face or things that you struggle with or decisions that you need to make or whatever it is. Those things have to be constantly, we have to be reminded all the time that those things are under the control of one person, one God. And that God, as we know, is one God and one Lord and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why we grab on to the idea of the Trinity, that God in three persons is still one. He is still one God. The same God, the same Jehovah, the same Yahweh that's here in Deuteronomy 6 is the same God that Jesus knew and that Paul knew and that all the writers of Scripture knew about, they always talked about the one God. So why else would they constantly say, morning and night, Lord, our Lord, our God, hear, O Israel, our Lord is one. Our Lord God is one God. And it's so critical. And we say, why do we have to constantly be nagged and reminded about that? <coughs> because there's, the world is constantly trying to invade your soul. And it's not any different today than it was thousands of years ago. It wasn't any different when Jesus was walking this earth. The world was trying and is continually trying to invade your life and mine. Sometimes it succeeds, right? It gets in there, and we have to get rid of it. Sometimes we just say, nope, absolutely not. This is nothing that I need to be involved in. And so that's the, if you want to call it that inner battle that goes on within us, Paul said it himself. He says, I, I want to do good, but sometimes I can't. I just, I'm constantly in this battle to do what God wants me to do. And it's not that we don't know what he wants us to do. We may not know some of the decisions that we have to make. We may be faced with this decision right today to do this or to do that or to go here, to move here, to take this job, to, to whatever it is. Those are decisions that God will help us with. But the, that struggle to do what he wants us to do is because we still have the ability 
to say, no, <laughs> I won't do it. And then what? Israel did it. They had a chance to go into the promised land a long time ago. And what did they say? <laughs> no. Nope, I'm too scared, I ain't going. So, whew. Let's get on to the, set, to the fifth verse. Because I've got like ten minutes left. And you're going to have to bear with me. We're going to move fast. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's not just in Deuteronomy 6, is it? Who else said it? Jesus said it. Jesus loved. The Shema Israel. He literally almost quoted it. In fact, let me read out of, you don't need to turn there, but just listen to this in Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> Starting in verse 28, it says this, And one of the scribes came up and heard, heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked Jesus this, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he adds this. This is the fascinating part of this. He adds this to it. He says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's not in Deuteronomy 6. It doesn't say that, does it? But he says it here, and he says it this way. The second, in other words, the second greatest commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said, kind of a smart like scribe, but he said, said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that. He is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as yourself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, <laughs> no one dared to ask any more questions of him. <laughs> I thought, whoa, what an absolute... <laughs> it's like... You could write a treatise on this. You could write pages and pages and pages on what he just said. But he said the second is like it. So he, he knows the Shema really well. He was, he's a Jew. He knew that. He understood that. But he said there's a second one that is just as important as the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the New Testament adds another aspect really to the love of God, and that is the love for other people. Now, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but sometimes I think it's harder to love people than it is to love Jesus. Am I the only one that feels that way? I don't know. Sometimes we can be really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can drive one another literally up a wall with whatever... Soapbox we're on at a particular time, whatever it is we've grabbed onto that somebody else looks, as, looks at us and says, you're absolutely crazy. But what does Jesus say? The second one is so important as the first. You cannot have just the first. You cannot survive just, you can survive just by loving God, don't get me wrong, but you can't survive in life, in society, among other people without the second one. Because the first one is the one that's supposed to motivate us to love other people. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. How much do you like yourself? If you hate yourself, you probably don't like other people very much. But you love others as you, as you like yourself. You, like, you take care of yourself. You feed yourself. You, you do what, what keeps you alive. You give yourself things. <laughs> right? And so we're to love others the same way as we like ourselves, as we love ourselves. And I thought about that because <clears throat> we were going to talk about the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments comes right before Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's given again in chapter 5. And what's the first commandment? You all know that. 
Thou shalt have no other gods beside me. What's the last one say? Number 10. <laughs> Thou shalt not covet your neighbor, his wife, his house, his property, his servants, his, his animals even, <laughs> or anything else that belongs to him. We are to love our neighbor. So it's like the law and the prophets is all wrapped up into this, Jesus says, into these two great commandments. And it's almost like the Ten Commandments are also wrapped up, sandwiched in between number one and number ten. You can't have one, one and ten without the others. But the one is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. In other words, there's no other God besides me. There's not one like me. And finally, he says, the last one is, is for you. You're not... You should not and shall not covet your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor. You can't have his things. You can't have his wife. You can't have his animals. You can't have anything that belongs to him. Coveting is a problem. But what's the opposite of that? The opposite is loving your neighbor. You know, we could spend a lot a lot of time on this, but there's something about the way God puts things together. I mean, there's so much miraculous. When you think about what these people have already seen, they're only in Deuteronomy 6, there's a whole lot of Bible after that. What they've already seen is an unbelievable display of what God can do. You know, we sometimes seek a sign. We seek miracles. Everybody loves miracles. We want to see God do something really spectacular. And he's done that. He's done that for you, right? You've seen those in your life. I've seen those. But we haven't, we haven't seen the Cecil B. DeMille's movie, Ten Commandments, exposed right in front of our face, where God has delivered... These, these people out of Egypt with these unbelievable miracles that he had to do in order for Pharaoh to let them go. We, saw, we haven't seen the pillar of fire that followed them around the wilderness to, to give them light by night. We haven't seen the manna that falls from heaven so they don't starve to death on their, on their journey. So they've seen all of this stuff. They've, they've sent spies into the land. The spies come back and one of them says, we need to go. This is great. God will provide. And he still said, no, after seeing all of the other stuff before. Do you understand? I, we need to understand that. The more we see God work, what does it do to us? Does it make us stronger in our faith, or do we just kind of, oh, well, there he goes again. You know, it's like I, I, I can't grab onto that, and sometimes I find myself in that same, same puddle. You know, I need to get up. So the law is wrapped up in those two things. And then the last part, the last verses, and we'll close with this, they're pretty self-explanatory. Just by reading them, they already preach to you. Because it says, you shall, you, these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign between your eye, or on your hand, and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your, heart, of your house. There's all these signs, there's all these senses that are used when we talk about when, when Jews would, would, would have these things on their door, or when they <coughs> wore these things around their forehead, these phylacteries that had little pieces of the Word of God in them. And Jesus said, that's not enough. You can't, it's not enough. Just have the outward sign of worship. You have to have the inward sign as well. You have to have that peace that only comes from God. And so he, in a sense, he says, you guys walking around with all this stuff on your body doesn't mean a thing when you don't really, truly surrender. And he called them a name that I would never want to be called, a whitewashed sepulcher. Dead on the inside, white and clean on the outside. You know, when you become a believer, what happens to you? 
your life, you're sure your, your worldview instantly changes, your life changes, you begin a journey that, that you stumble through the first few, few years or whatever, you do things and say things that you go, I can't imagine some of the things I said in churches that when I was only a year old in the Lord, they must have gone, oh boy, this guy is really cool. So it's like you grow, you learn, and as you grow and learn, no matter what your age, you begin to understand what it means to be on that journey to fulfill what God has promised for us. And his promises are constantly never changing. You know, these last verses, they hit a nerve with our families. They should. You may not be married. You may not have kids. Someday you will. You've been around kids. You know what it's like. You see parents. You know what it's like your parents raised you. You know what it's like to have kids in your home. You know what it's like to try to pass on to your children something that is so vital and important for them. And he's saying no matter what you're doing, it isn't necessarily just in church. Church is a great place to exhibit God's word and to hear about it. But what you, when you're in your house, when you go to bed, when you rise up in the morning, when you're at your job, no matter where it is, what does he say? They shall be with you. You shall teach your children those things all the time. And so that's a, that's a scary and big responsibility, right? And God says, hey, one, one commentator put it this way. He says, Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. Why is that? Because just like the Jews were to do, we are to do the same thing. We're to pass it on one person to the next, to their kids, to their grandkids, to the next generation, so that now in, in 2020, it's been almost over 1900 and some years that that gospel has spread and continually changes people's lives. Why? Because we've obeyed what God has said, how to pass it on. And so our responsibility lies in, in these two verses. We are to love God with all our might, all of our soul, all of our strength, all that we have. And then we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And your kids can be your neighbor. Your family can be your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Anybody you come in contact with. So we have a responsibility. It's a heavy responsibility. We want our children to be people of faith. We want to teach them at an early age and remind them in every way possible about our faith and personal commitment to it. Right? Then, at that point, if you've done your job, it's up to them. No matter who you share with, it's always up to them and to the Lord. Who's calling some. We don't know who he's calling. We just preach to everybody. Say, God, all people, and use us in the meantime. So, we'll close with that. I just want to ask some questions or just share some things with you really quickly that you can maybe even talk about in your GCs. But first thing, the first one is there is no God like Yahweh. He's the one and only God. And then what is your unique challenge that you are facing today? I don't know what that is. Like the Israelites, are you, are you up to that point where you have to make some kind of decision to do something that takes a whole lot of prayer and convincing by God to do? Third thing, are you challenged to be obedient out of the love you have for him and his love for you and not simply out of compulsion? What did John say? John said, <laughs> excuse me, we love because he loved us first, right? So do we love him out of compulsion because we're told to, because we have to, because if we don't, he's going to strike us? No, we love him because he, why he does this sometimes, I don't know, but he loves us. His love is unbelievable. You can all quote John 3, 16. He loved so much that he gave. And those are the words you need to concentrate on in that verse. He loved you so much, he loved me so much that he gave. And he gave Jesus. So, 
last one is, do you pray without ceasing for your kids? Do you desire that they become people of faith? And do you recognize that teaching your children or anybody else involves not only the sharing of God's truth, but living out your life in front of them? Anybody who's, who's a parent and has kids knows that you've had some failures in that line. I have myself. But the thing is, do we concentrate on passing that on so that Christianity can grow, so God can bless us and those we share with? So God is so good. Remember these verses. You know, write them on your refrigerator. Do whatever it is. There's something about using every sense that God gave us. You know, we have this. We have the sense of sight, hearing. We have this. We have the sense of smell, of taste, and of touch. All these things are involved when you think about the early church when they met. What did they do when they when they when they got together? They listened to the apostles' teaching. They fellowshiped together. They broke bread together, and they prayed. And breaking bread could be a potluck, or it could be sharing in communion together. We do that as we gather together as a church, don't we? And it's been that way for centuries, and it will continue to be that way. So with that, let's pray, shall we? Father, we are so grateful for Oh, so many things. Um, just that you have shown us in so many ways how marvelous and powerful and wonderful you are. But you have shown us sometimes in very quiet ways. In our prayer time, in our surrender to you, in all those that we do personally between ourselves and you, you have shown yourself to be so mighty. So we, we say that, that we need to listen We need to hear, O Israel, hear, O church, the Lord is one. And we need to love you with all of our might, soul, and our strength. So I thank you for just those people that are here today, that they have sat through some time of having to listen and hopefully to take something into their heart concerning your word. Thank you for this portion of scripture, Father. We need to hear it every day. So thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said.